hails, fr hails from Canada, from the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia University. And he helped build up the Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab. Please welcome Nikolai. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, thank you all for just uh, coming at the, to the latest uh, talk tonight. And uh, thank you for CCC for inviting us. Um, uh, it's a great honor for us to be here. Um, just a little bit uh, about myself, just a little bit of background. Like uh, I'm a German Swiss citizen, um, but I work now in Montreal for the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. And um, since the beginning of the year, like, or for me better, since April, I helped uh, build up the, what we call the Digital Mass Atrocity uh, Prevention Lab. And I mean, everyone has a lab these days, and so what, what we want to do with that is actually kind of try and reach out into different communities. Like we do a lot of policy work, um, but obviously like since we have like a, a, a hacking audience tonight, like we also want to be involved in like uh, tech communities and uh, hacking communities. So when we saw the talk uh, on the keynote and then the, the introduction on, uh, to, to this Congress, um, like my colleagues and I were really pleased to see that there is a uh, way that, uh, like a need from the community actually to open up and, and kind of let people who are not necessarily hackers, like my background is international relations and, and not necessarily the deep tech. Um, I'm interested in it and like I follow what the CCC is doing for the last couple of years. Um, and especially one talk uh, just at the, the camp this, this year by, by Claudio uh, about uh, helping the helpless where he basically told the, the InfoSec community to reach out to human rights groups and, and help them where they, where they can actually be helpful. Um, that resonated with us, and we, we come from like, the other side. And basically, in Montreal, like we're a fairly small team. And so, uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of, uh, I would say, 20 minutes is just a little bit what we did over like the last seven, eight, nine months. Um, and it's going to be like pretty much in chronological order. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about what the UN is doing in peacekeeping and peace tech. Um, we did a big research project using Media Cloud. Uh, that's a tool by the, the Berkman Center and the MIT Center for Civic Media. We uh, kind of encouraged, like we, we, we uh, talked to a lot of uh, technologists and, and hackers uh, at various hackathons, and so we kind of want to share some lessons learned. Um, and like if, if there's time, I just want to go through like a couple of various projects, which we found a little bit interesting, very interesting, and just kind of see what, uh, what, what you could learn from it. And, and like just open the dialogue between different fields, because obviously I'm coming from a fairly different field uh, than many of you. Um, so one thing we do at the, the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, uh, we have a workshop uh, on mass atrocity prevention. So it's mainly for policymakers and people in the peace, uh, keeping and peace uh, building community. Uh, a lot of people with a non-technical background. And what we try to do in the last couple of years is getting more tech stuff into the workshops. Um, you see here at this, at this picture, that's like the workshop uh, in the middle. Uh, we have uh, Walter Dorn, who is a professor in uh, Kingston, Ontario, in Canada. And he looks on how like, the UN is using technology or could be potentially using technology uh, to monitor peace treaties or just kind of look at, look at new ways. Because, I mean, obviously, it's 2015, and, and the UN is finally kind of catching up to that. Um, for those who are interested, like there is earlier this year, like the UN actually came off, come, come out with a final report on how they can use uh, new technologies in, in peacekeeping. Um, and Walter Dorn was part of, of that kind of expert panel. Um, so there is, there are things happening. I mean, the UN is a slow and, and, and sometimes very kind of hard to, like a ship, hard to maneuver. Um, so it's interesting to see that even there, there's kind of thinking about technology and then. Um, admittedly, like it is more like on the military side of things. So, like they, they think about like the new the, the new peacekeeping uh, kind of uh, force and then how to kind of get them equipped. Um, but what we also have been involved with is like a growing field of, of what they call peace tech, um, which is more like on the on the civil side and really kind of I, I believe a lot of people with, with, with good intentions are being part of that. And like, uh, it seems like there are a couple of conferences out there um, since, I guess, 2010, 2011, they, they started. And what they want to do is try a couple of, try to get a lot of 
people from the hacking community, software development community together with peace building community. So it's, it's about kind of getting the barriers down between different, uh, different fields. Because that's also what we saw over like pretty much the last year in the different events we, we participated in. Like it is difficult for those fields to talk to each other. There are, there's different languages, different backgrounds, and like different cultures. And we, we see bene a benefit in actually in kind of getting those barriers down in a, in a bit. Um, so that would be one part of just kind of informing you what's out there. There's way more stuff out there. And um, that's just like a, a brief overview. Um, the other thing what we did is uh, at, at the Montreal Institute, we have a media monitoring project where basically we do qualitative research in countries which might be uh, at risk of, of mass atrocity or atrocity crimes. Uh, there are other NGOs out there. The, the Crisis Group, for example, has a very prominent project as well. Um, but what we find is that it's very difficult to just kind of, we, we basically rely on, rely on interns who like scape, look at the media landscapes in, in those countries and look at international media and then see what, what's actually happening. But it's very qualitative work. So we were thrilled when we saw that there is a way to actually use more quantitative methods. Um, there's a, a, a tweet by Ethan Zuckerman, which we basically followed. We wrote a proposal for this, and we kindly got uh, invited to do research uh, with the Media Lab. Um, what we did there was we used the Media Cloud uh, framework. They, they have a couple of other tools. We mainly used the Media Matter dashboard, which pretty much is like a dashboard which you can query a database in this, in this, uh, in the sense that we, we query the database about U.S. mainstream media. Um, there's about 25 biggest media sources in the U.S. And basically, just look. You can you can query for different for different uh, subjects, and then it gives you like a timeline where you see like it's basically uh, sentences per day, and then over the timeline which you which you have uh, looked at, and you can get like a world cloud. And, and um, it's it's very good to kind of just get a, a very brief overview on on a, on a topic. And what we did, we were really interested in a lot of countries we did research on, like in Sub-Saharan Africa mainly. So we wanted to know how um, Sub-Saharan Africa is presented in US mainstream media, because many of the things you, you would normally think is like, there are a couple of topics which always come up, but uh, many other good things which happen in Sub-Saharan African countries, they never show up. Um, so what you see here, we have a couple of countries like Cameroon, Niger, South Sudan, Uganda. They're all, like, they're all plotted uh, next to each other. And what we found is that compared to other topics, there's not much coverage at all, if there is. And if there's, uh, if there's actually interest, you see it here, it's when there's a World Cup. So there's like a, an event in the West, which uh, then, then actually sparks interest in media attention. And Obviously, now we don't really have too much to compare it to, so we figured that like, we needed something which is very prominent in US mainstream media, and that is Kim Kardashian. I'm not sure if you know who she is. She's like a, a media celebrity. But when you plot it against like, what, what, what the, the media attention she gets, it's way more than what all those nine uh, sub-Saharan African countries get combined. Um, that's actually not nothing new. We had we had that kind of research uh, it has been done like since the 60s, but now we can actually show it on, on like with, with actual like a lot of data behind it. Um, then we also went into like a more like a, a qualitative sort of research where we looked at uh, 50 articles each, and what we saw was like basically we have like f like 340 stories which are which are valid, and when you look at what the frame of those stories is. It was terror related, it's Ebola related, or soccer related. That, that's pretty much main, the, the, main, the main topics you get on, on mainstream media reporting in Africa is, is that. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of good things which are happening in those countries are not getting reported. That's just not, not there. Um, so when we kind of were at that stage, we, we looked at the, the supply side of things. That's what the media supplies, and that's what people can, can read and all. And we also looked uh, at, at the same time when we when we did the research. There was there was an article by by Quinn Norton um, on Medium where she basically says that um, it's also on the demand side. Like so, a lot of people actually don't really want to like read anything else. So she has a very strong 
uh, quote there where she says, like, you people never click the fucking link. Um, so, and when, when we kind of think about mass atrocity prevention or prevention of, of atrocities, uh, we, we believe it's important to know that um, the, the way we see a lot of countries, like uh, African countries especially, um, we need like another, we need another frame. We just don't need only the, the, the frame we, we have, uh, which gets, gets normally portrayed like Ebola and, and terror related. Um, then one thing we kind of did at the same time when we, when we talked about, uh, when we did the research, when we, um, when we wrote the proposal right at the beginning, um, we had like a little mishap. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in like the, the philosophy track we have here at the, at, at the, the Congress. And so I want to share like the, the, the it's like an, a little anecdote. Um, so basically what happened, I like saw, we saw the, we saw the proposal and I went, uh, I just saw it on, on, on my work computer and then I went, I went home uh, on my laptop. And so I went home and, and wrote like an email just kind of trying to figure out, hey guys, um, what is that research about, et cetera, and uh, just had a couple of, of questions. What I didn't know was that um, my wife actually, she installed a, a Chromium plugin, which would actually mock the, 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 the overuse of the word cloud and turn it into butt. Um, so <laughs> what happened, I read this really long, elaborate email because I think that it was a great project, and then this is what I get back. Um, FYI, it's media cloud, not media butt. Um, I'm really curious, et cetera. Um, obviously, it was a fail. We felt, we felt embarrassed, but we were lucky and we got it. But like, yeah, I think it's important to kind of share whatever mishaps you have, be it in like software development or especially in academia. Um, so just putting it out there very briefly. Um, then I guess the last thing I want to I talk about is like we participate in various hackathons, and that's there were sometimes there were like like free and open source software hackers there. There was a lot of people work from just like the traditional tech community. Like in Montreal, we have a lot of software developers. Um, and obviously out there, there's like some sort of like a hackathon fatigue. Um, I mean, you see, you see there like T-Mobile and Red Bull and Evernote, they're like basically big corporations using hackathons and hacking culture in a way to, to basically re outsource their R&D. Um, so we also saw kind of like a, a hackathon that fatigue in, in what, 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 he, what we did, and we had like a couple of criticisms. Like, pretty much the biggest uh, thing we noticed was that when we, when like a lot of people who organized hackathons we participated in, they tried to bring actually both pieces together, um, the tech community and then the, the, the peace building community, for example. Um, but oftentimes it was really difficult to actually get enough people with the, the tech knowledge. So you had like 40, 50 people um, but only two or three were, were, were able to code. Um, which then in the end, if you have to actually like, try to, to get some sort of ideas going and uh, deploy the project, you actually um, end up with, with a lot of policy talk and a lot of, like th there wasn't as much like cross-culturization as, as, as like and then talking between the fields as, as I would have kind of hoped for it. Um, but also like uh, one, I, I would say, more like on, on the positive side of things, an example was uh, where we participated in like the Talking Peace Festival, where we found like uh, that they had a hackathon in in, uh, in Washington D.C. and we participated in that, and there we found a good mix of of both people who actually knew how to code, knew kind of how to think about surveillance and, and kind of think about the important topics. I guess the audience here is is really concerned about. Um, so, and, and what we also found is that. When you think about building whatever kind of technology, it's really important to be engaged with the community, those, those uh, people uh, it, it should be served with or for. Um, so we, we found like this was something we felt like there was a lot of movement. I think there was interest from both sides. So it wasn't only from like the political policy side, but also from the side uh, of, of, of the tech knowledge. And we think, and, and so, like, in a way, we like what, what uh, a lot of NGOs and, and human rights groups could use, like hackathons or similar ideas could use it for, is actually like, yeah, build, trying to 
get, get, get a bridge between those two communities. I know there's, like, I mean, uh, today we, we heard a lot of, a lot of uh, fairly depressing stories, and, and uh, I don't want to end with, like, a, a happy ending, but, like, I'm just, like, what I, what I want to say is that uh, we feel that there is, like, there are a lot of people who think they could be um, working together to actually build technologies which could help people in human rights situations. And uh, what we think in, in Montreal is actually just trying to engage and, and get together and, and see where that leads. That's part of why I'm here. That's kind of like I'm really happy to talk uh, to people who like, have different thoughts and, and actually give us feedback on, on what we can improve. Because uh, um, if it is about talking to each other, that's, that's something we, we would really be uh, engaging in. OK. And so like, just to give you like, an example, a couple of projects uh, we found fairly interesting or kind of we, we came across during, during uh, the, the time we, we, we did the research and then in the last half year. Um, There's a project called uh, the Early Warning, uh, the Early Warning System, which basically has a couple of components. It has like a, a statistical analysis method and some sort of like an expert crowdsource. So uh, they ask a lot of people from uh, the peace building community and then different other communities, like what, what they're what they going to think is going to happen in the next 12 months in country X, Y, Z. And then they give opinion. Like it's, it's, fairly, it's a fairly big opinion poll too. It's about like I think two, 200 people uh, participating from different fields. So it kind of tries to, to get a couple of methods together. And, um, I'm, I'm very sure that like a lot of people who are engaged with the with this project would be interested in how to make those tools better, um, because what what we kind of think is that uh, a lot of NGOs and human rights groups what they can offer is kind of like a network to connect people with with each other, and they also have like a oftentimes quite a better knowledge of how to actually get the message out rather than if you just have. Um, Technologists and, and, and attackers who just think about the deep tech and, and, and that's what they're doing. And so, like, kind of getting their, their heads away from the, the keyboard and actually in the wider world and how it is deployed, et cetera. Um, so, it'd be great if, if we could get some feedback on that as well. Um, then there's another, uh, actually, like, I, I'm very kind of hesitant to, to promote apps because I'm, I'm not really sure how just an app. It by itself can, can promote peacekeeping or mass atrocity prevention. It's just, I, I don't really see that's necessarily like a, a good way of promoting it. But there's this one app we found pretty interesting. Um, it's called Eyewitness, and basically what it does, it is, it is an app to um, document ma atrocity crimes. Um, and like, it, it's, you can just download it, and it kind of looks at, uh, takes the security of the people who use it very seriously. Um, so for example, like, uh, you, you, it's not just like a logo on the app, but it's kind of, it's, it's more hidden in, in, within the OS. Um, but actually to get to that point, it took a lot of work from security researchers to actually be able to make photos of an atrocity and then securely transmit it to, uh, I think it's the International Bar Association. Uh, which then can use those pictures with timestamps, et cetera, then to, to be actual legal documents in, uh, for example, ICT, the International Criminal Court cases. Um, I think the last thing I would ha do is just kind of, there are like three Canadian companies, I think a couple of them might be even at the Congress. Uh, so we, we try to kind of engage with, with them, like uh, for example, Equality, Subgraph, and Siphon. Uh, they work very much with, with free and open source software uh, in the field of, of human rights and kind of since we're very new with what we're doing at the Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab, uh, it would be great if we could just kind of get, get a conversation going, seeing what's actually, what we're doing really badly from a security perspective. Um, and yeah, so if I think that should be actually most of what I, what I wanted to share, um, I will put a couple of a couple of uh, links already of, of what we did and, and what we what we did on on, on an etherpad, but uh, feel free to just reach out, write your comments in there. You, you can't even troll. I will just delete it. Um, and yeah, I think that would be the the, the main thing of my talk. Uh, give us feedback and let us know what you think, and then be critical.
Thank you very much, Nikolai. Okay. Uh, we have actually plenty of time for questions. So if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones. Are there questions from IRC? Coming up. No questions from IRC. Any questions from the audience? No. Go on. Uh, please, please go to the microphone so our listeners at home can hear you and we can also record it. Microphone front left, please. Uh, from left. Hi. Hey. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess some reflections because you were also asking for input. Um, the first one was I'm, I'm interested if anyone here is developing USSD uh, or SIM application toolkits or any type of knowledge, technology that um, I guess it's called technological blending or whatever you call it, but to bridge the digital divide between people with dumb phones um, as, and feature phones, which are pretty much the new dumb phone. And I guess, yeah, the entry level of an Android phone that can run that app is always increasingly going down. Um, but yeah, I mean, successful projects like Ushahidi have thought about that integration with the, yeah, dumb phones from the, the start. So I would be interested if we have those skills or SIM application toolkit, for example. Is that a completely neglected technology? Um, that's just, I mm -hmm. guess, more of a brain fart, more of an idea. Um, and then the, the second question is, uh, how do you deal with the fact that in situations like this, you do usually have tech experts, usually from the global north, narrating the stories of the global south as a big generalization but mm. it's a tendency and and how does that get resolved um yeah right well I, th I think the second question like i could answer in a way that a lot of what we're doing is, is, is part of a learning experience especially for, mes for myself personally like i know my colleagues that do that work for a longer time and like they, they've been involved in in peace building projects for a long time so they were actually talking about like you know how getting Western narratives, getting them into like sort of like narratives where they kind of shouldn't be, um, and so they actually they, they know way more about about that. But for us, like or for me personally, it's just kind of like a learning experience. That's why we try to reach out. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more uh, if, if if that's possible later. Great. Uh, sorry, just to add a selfish point, I'm r writing a thesis on the topic. So if anyone wants to continue a conversation later, sure. I'm sure that's the point of this whole session anyway. <laughs> continue a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Microphone on the front right, please. Yeah, thematically bridging the early warning project and the media cloud project. Um, I'm wondering, it seems kind of plausible to me that mass atrocities are introduced by some media activity locally or globally. And I'm wondering if you're aware of any research or if you have done any research into that direction, analyzing media and uh, as an early warning for mass atrocities, are you aware of any research in, done in that direction? Yeah, like I mean, one, one piece why, why we were interested in what, what Media Cloud is providing is that it actually measures what, what's happening uh, like in, in the media environment in, in, in certain countries, uh, for example, Burundi. Um, and w one thing we kind of were thinking about, and that's just an idea, which, which would be interesting to get also some feedback about it. Like there's, there's something called the, the Cheetal project. It's like the general database on language and uh, tone. And I mean, it's a project with like actually Google is behind some of that. And then they basically look at media environments in almost real time. So when you, when you, when you basically have an environment where, where you think there might, there might be atrocities happening in, in the near future, that could be something to look at because you can actually monitor what, what's happening. But I mean, then again, monitoring is close to then again also like you, you surveil a whole country and you surveil what's happening in, in their in their in their environment. But like that's something we, we talked about. Like I mean, the the research on what like uh, different technologies or, or media play in, in mass atrocities. That that's, that's I think that's a whole range of literature out there. Um, when you look at the, at the Rwandan genocide, for example, there's a whole bandwidth of, of, of uh, literature on, on like radio as being the enabling technology because there was like uh, there was lies and then and kind of hate speech trans transmitted over radio technology, for example. 
Um, so there is a, a whole bunch of research on, on that topic. The microphone front left, please. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Um, could you expand a little bit, like in an ideal world, what kind of software would be missing from a peace building or, or from a UN perspective? Um, in an ideal world, like, I mean, if there is such a thing. Uh, I think what, what we're actually interested in is, is uh, how to enable collaboration. I think collaboration tools might be something really interesting to, to look at because you have, you have in, in, in some environments, you have many different NGOs with different, different kind of channels and, and how they work with each other. So uh, if you make it like a community effort, it might be interesting to look at just basic collaboration tools and how to implement them. I mean, from, from the little insight I got over the work uh, I did over the last couple of months, uh, over like a year, was that oftentimes the tools are there, and then tools are there um, to be used, but they're actually not embraced or not used by a lot of NGOs or, like, I mean, when we, when we look at like, a lot of surveillance technologies, right, or anti-surveillance technologies, um, people know about it, but they don't really know how to use it, and it actually would be great to have better resources. I mean, they're, so far, they're, like, there are wikis, and, and there, there's a way to implement it, but it also, I think it needs the human factor to actually push people to, to use the technologies uh, who could be provided in them. Microphone front right, please. Um, so I understood that you are covering official media reports with Media Cloud. Right. Are you also researching already in the social media, like the publicly available, um, whatever, Twitter streams and stuff right. like that to analyze um, them? Like us personally, we don't. Um, I mean, obviously there is there is, uh, like, I've been involved in a couple of projects which, or, like, I know about it, like I said, um, who do that, um, but that's the thing, like, us, as, like, we, we are, we're not, we're like, a handful of people, actually, at, at my institute, and, like, we, we don't, at, at this point, we don't have the, the technological skills, or the, te the tech skills, and, and some of it is actually fairly easy, I suppose. Um, I mean, there, there, there are tools out there on which you can, like, look at what's, what's happening on Twitter, et cetera, and, uh, Actually, like at this at this, this hackathon in, in, in Washington D.C., we had something which basically looked at, at this, uh, the Cheetah project, Media Cloud, and Twitter at the same time, as some sort of like a, a big monitoring system or risk assessment system. System, and the interesting thing about Cheetah is it also evaluates tone. So basically, if you have a sentence which is kind of negative towards a, a special group, it would kind of it could theoretically trigger trigger something. And, and we had we had a couple of guys who like. Uh, like uh, coded in Python, they coded like a prototype, and then basically they they, they would ba would then send it automatically a message to to the peace peace uh, building people on the ground. Um, so there's thinking about it. Like I'm I'm not really sure who else is thinking about that kind of stuff, but I mean the fact is like the stuff's going to be more digital like in the years to come. So like I think the peace building community will have to catch up to that. To, I think that uh, Twitter sentiments or also image recognition, mm -hmm. this can help. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Microphone front left, please. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. One thing that, that was missing for me was um, uh, actions for peace enforcement, which you, I think, did not cover in the talk, did you? What you're talking um, about? Peace enforcement is the third escalation step for UN um, atrocity prevention. What well, you mean, deploying forces, etc.? I mean, deploy forces to <laughs> right. prevent <laughs> well, like stuff. So, so they're, they're, what what I, I saw here was mostly reactive. Um, I mean, right. international law is reactive on these atrocities. Um, some, I think, technology can o could also be used um, as an offensive weapon. Um, the eyewitness um, mm. idea, I think, was a was a good start. If you combine it, for example, with um, image rec recognition on the ground, or let's say um, drones, mm -hmm. or small um, mini drones that right. that fly over the um, the area affected, so that they they are also visible, right. so that people on the ground who might commit atrocities can also see that they are witnesses, right? Um, stuff like that, so that you build up offensive ca um, capabilities with um, technology. Mm -hmm. I think that will also be interesting. Right, that's something I, I personally haven't thought about yet, but, but thanks for, for the input. That's great.
Do we have any questions from IRC? No? Uh, then, one last time, microphone front left, please. Uh, you had mentioned using technology for looking at the media, and it seemed like also some things were leveraging um, what's already been uh, done by uh, different organizations involved in preventing atrocities. Um, and it seemed like you thought that Eyewitness was an example of an app that may not be a very effective direction for technology investment. Um, but it seems like the appeal of an app like that is that it's about directly impacting uh, the atrocity, whereas the media and just leveraging other people's abilities seems more indirect. Um, it seems like this image recognition is also a way of using technology to more directly impact things. I kind of wonder if there are other directions that would come to your mind um, as far as having a direct impact on an atrocity or potential atrocity. Well, actually, just to correct you, I think, I think uh, what, what I meant with the apps, in, in general, I think, uh, like I've seen a lot of apps which just don't really make much sense. It's basically just like a website and an app, and an app umbrella, um, just kind of repackaging content. Um, actually, the, the, mass, the, the, the eyewitness app, we found comparatively very, very uh, kind of smart in, in the way of they thought about it. Um, so, so what was the other, the other part of your question? Whether we think about other ways of... Yeah, kind of what we've been talking about so far besides eyewitness is like image recognition where it seems like clearly the technology itself is playing an integral role in preventing or documenting an atrocity. Um, so I was wondering if there are other ways that the technology can be used to directly impact uh, either the prevention or uh, the results of an atrocity. Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, like I'm not really sure like whether we thought about image recognition in, in, the, in that sense uh, as you describe it. Um, but I mean, that's part of why we're here because like we kind of want to get input on like a lot of different things. I mean, obviously like uh, you, can, you can research a lot but just getting like a human feedback on, on, on things would be is, is very valuable. So uh, if, if uh, you can stick around a couple of minutes later, I would be happy to talk more. That's okay. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you.